Everyone understands the concept of energy or force. It's the ability to make things happen. And we're most familiar with it on a physical level, of course. You, you push things, you pull things, you twist things. The concept of subtle energies is conveying the idea that there are other kinds of forces that are not the, the forces known to ordinary physics, but which nevertheless can have real effects, either in terms of, say, actually moving something or if biological effects like healing or the like. I want to talk a little bit about one of the most studied forms of what seems like a subtle energy. That's what's called psychokinesis, or the old term for it was telekinesis, and an a material effect on the world simply by the action of the mind alone. This has been studied extensively in laboratory experiments over the years. One of the main impetus for laboratory studies was a gambler who came to J.B. Ryan's laboratory back in the late 30s or early 40s and said, you know, I shoot craps for a living and I don't cheat, I don't have a loaded dice or anything, but lately I've read a book by a statistician and he's proven conclusively that I can't make the nice living that I do. What am I doing? And this began extensive laboratory tests where first dice were thrown by hand and then to eliminate any funny ways you might throw them, machines to throw the dice and so forth. And it was established in quite a few experiments that simply by willing the dice to come up in a certain way, you got that effect more often than if you just had your machine throw the dice over and over again without anybody wishing for any particular outcome. My own involvement in psychokinesis research, as I describe it in my End of Materialism book, came as a result of seeing a man who could apparently influence the spin of a silver dollar and get a very high percentage of either heads or tails depending on what he said he wanted. I say apparently because I was skeptical at first. This guy, I was young, this guy was a little too slick. I, I kept thinking something must be wrong there. He's got some kind of gimmick or something like that. But as I describe in the book, time after time, I watched him influence this coin, even when somebody else was spinning it, and get much more of a percentage of the target face, heads or tails, whichever you designated, than you would expect by chance. So, I once saw him do an absolutely amazing demonstration of it that, interestingly enough, was so good that I forgot about it. I was embarrassed when I was writing The End of Materialism. I had described some of my own experiments with a spinning silver coin, and I went back to a, my journal article about this research to check the accuracy of the figures I remembered and found I had totally forgotten the most remarkable instance of coin spinning I saw. Anyway, let me tell you about that as an example of researching a subtle energy. I think a spinning silver coin is a very psychologically appealing target face because sometimes it looks as if you can either see the head side or see the tail side even though lots of the times it's just a blur. And of course if you want heads you feel like you want to push on it to make it come up heads, push that head side down and flat, or, or vice versa. Now, letting people spin the coin by hand is very tricky. You don't know what tricks might be involved in spinning it, what kind of biases. So I invented a very nice machine to do this. The first diagram shows you the overall look of the machine, where basically a coin rolls down a chute, an arm bats it out onto a table, it spins around and eventually falls, while someone who can't touch the machine or blow in the coin or anything is asked to make it heads a certain number of times, make it tails a number of times. I'm quite proud of this machine. It's the closest I ever got to being a mad scientist or Rube Goldberg inventor. So, if, if you look at it, for instance, there's the diagram of the machine and there's the slot where you put the coin in. And the coin was always put in heads up facing toward the back of the machine to eliminate any problems there. 
And then the experimenter would press a switch on the end of a flexible cord so you couldn't pull on the machine to influence it. And the coin would roll down the chute and hit a little trigger switch, and then the bat arm would come out and bat the coin out so it spun around on the table until it slowed down and fell down. And meanwhile, a subject would be attempting to make it come out one way or the other. Uh, I was charmed with this machine. I didn't get very good results with it. I wasn't able to have a highly talented person work at it. I did some stuff with college students and had one psychic try it who wasn't sure whether he could do that sort of thing. And, and his results were a chance, except they were a very funny chance results. Because we'd started out that with a coin that was biased slightly in one direction. Bias doesn't matter, incidentally, when you have an equal number of heads and tails as target, because it cancels out and works against you as much as it works for you. Anyway, it was biased one way before we started the experiment, and after the experiment, even though his results were a chance, it was biased the other way. That was very odd. That's the sort of result in parapsychological research where you can't claim you found anything in particular, but it's very hard to go away thinking nothing happened and it, it, it keeps your curiosity aroused. Anyway, this kind of research with dice or with spinning silver dollars or the like is now terribly old-fashioned because beginning back in the 1970s people developed what we might call an electronic coin flipper. Some Integrated circuits would control two lights, say a red light and a green light, and they were flashing back and forth, and it was completely random which one would flash for a second at a given time. And it would be set up to run, say, a hundred tri trials altogether, and the subject would be sat down there and told, okay, this time make the green light come on more than the red light. You finish that time, and then the experiment would say, okay, make the red light come on more than the green light. Well, this produces results. Again, it's, it's nothing enormous. Instead of 50-50, you might get 51%, 52%, 53%, but it becomes quite statistically significant after a while. It means sometimes the mind is reaching out and affecting that machinery. But what's it affecting? Yeah, now, see, this goes back to the fact that we're used to mechanical forces in affecting them. If you're trying to affect rolling dice, you can imagine the dice is, is coming to its last bounce and ready to roll over onto the correct target face, and your mind pushes it a little more so it'll come down to the right place. Or if it's going to roll off the correct one to the wrong one, it sort of pulls on it. Or with the spinning silver coin, you can easily picture yourself pushing or pulling on the coin at certain times. But what do you push on in an electronic device? I mean, you know, even if you could look at the inside of these devices, it wouldn't mean anything. You know, it's transistors or an integrated circuit or something like that. And yet, the intention to make it operate in a certain way has a small but significant effect. This, to me, is a great reminder that subtle energies, whatever they are, are indeed very subtle. They're, they're affecting something at a much more complex or sophisticated level than are simply pushing and pulling kinds of things. And that, of course, is what makes the study of psychokinesis, of subtle energies, so interesting. And yeah, most of the time they're a small effect, but the challenge of trying to understand them is really, really interesting. And once in a while, as I said, you can have a quite massive effect. And to my amazement, even though I think I'm open-minded, as I describe in The End of Materialism, I forgot all about that effect for years. What an interesting world we live in. At ESOM, the Society for the Study of Subtle Energies and Energy Medicine, at our annual meetings, we talk about these things. Come and join us.